Our guest today at the NYSC is Jeffrey Gitterman, co-founding partner of Gitterman Wealth Management and creator of Sustainable Impact and ESG Investing Services. In addition, Jeff is also the author of Beyond Success, Redefining the Meaning of Prosperity and the associate producer of a feature film documentary called Planetary. Jeff, thanks so much for joining us. Thanks for having me on the show. So tell us, you just wrapped up Climate Week in New York. Are you seeing any kind of effects from that? Well, I've seen a lot of people wearing sustainable development gold pins, so that's been nice. Usually I'm the only one in the city or on the subways wearing it. But certainly Greta being here and really inspiring on social media, asset management firms, investment companies, dialogue that we haven't seen in a while has been tremendous. Um, whether you're a fan or not, she's certainly done a better job, I think, of anyone of really getting the conversation on the front table and making it something that we all need to be talking about and discussing. Do you think that's moving institutional investors in this direction? You know, I spend a lot of my time on the institutional asset management side, meeting with companies like PIMCO and Allianz and Hermes and Schroeders, and I can tell you they're all way ahead on the climate change issue. They're dealing with it, they're looking at analytics, they're looking at how to look at companies that they're owning as to whether or not they're climate prepared in a way that we're really not seeing in the wealth management space yet. I think advisors are still kind of head in the sand a little bit, um, maybe not even clear whether climate change is even a real issue, which is sad to hear. But the asset management firms, the ratings companies, Moody's is just bought 427, MSCI purchased a ESG rating and data company. We're seeing the same thing at S&P and Fitch. So from a big umbrella standpoint, the asset management industry is kind of full in on climate change and climate de-risking their portfolios. Jeff, let's talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, you have a really unique lens coming from historic financial services, RIA, asset allocator. Um, now on the forefront of education awareness, bringing visibility to not only climate change, but ESG more broadly. Um, you've come off a great conference you put together at the United Nations, um, the Family Office Impact Summit. And I think that's, that's really starting to amplify. I think you had 250, 275 yep. leading families come to the UN Absolutely. to have this discussion. Yep. And if I can just fast forward for a moment and we'll come back to it. You have another one in December, right? Uh, financial advisors, yes. 700, uh, I think it's 700. Yes, yeah. So you know, what's different today than maybe even just a couple of years ago, but even 12 months ago, where you're able to convene these large groups who are um, in the financial service business who are looking to be educated on ESG and climate change? You know, what we're seeing is, and you're seeing this from a lot of the trends reports, whether it's from Morgan Stanley or some of the other institutions, is that clients are asking this question about their advisor. Is there climate change action being taken in my portfolio? Is it ESG friendly, environmental, socially, and governance conscious? <clears throat> Barron's just said that there's been a 39% increase year over year of clients asking their advisors about ESG and impact investing. That's a huge trend. I mean, a 39% increase year over year in anything in the financial industry is a large trend. So it's making advisors more and more aware that they've got to brush up on the topic. I like to say advisors are becoming impact aware. They're, they're not knowledgeable yet. They haven't really done their homework yet, but they are extremely keen on the fact that their clients are asking more and more. And then we're seeing product innovation happen on almost a daily basis in the ESG and impact space. You can't really turn your head without seeing a new company launching either a new ETF or a new mutual fund or rebranding or renaming an old fund so it makes it seem like they're heavy into the industry. So things are changing just from an overall awareness space. And I think the train has kind of left the station in this conversation and you've got to get on. So very much seems to be, uh, which is a little surprising for me, a bottom up. Right. It, it's the uh, stakeholder becoming a consumer, the consumer becoming stakeholders in brands and investments that they believe in that are driving, as, as you say, impact awareness. Uh, is, is the next stage uh, impact advocate, impact uh, allocator? W what, what comes next? You know, it's interesting. We use an hourglass in our presentations. And on the top of the hourglass is all the product innovation that's coming into the marketplace. And on the bottom of the hourglass is all of the client awareness and questions going towards their advisor. So we're seeing huge swell of demand on both sides and that 
bottleneck in the middle of that hourglass is the advisor. So they're still kind of holding up the capital flow. It's why we got so interested in educating that space because we really do think that advisors who control the wallet of probably 80 trillion in assets when you go around the globe are the bottleneck holding back capital moving to really solve these problems. And kind of like I've always looked at the digital asset space for decentralization and what can happen to empower the individual, the person on the ground that doesn't have banking access, I look at the same thing and trend happening in the impact space. The clients are the one driving this demand. It's not the advisors who have a hot new product who are trying to sell it to their client. It's the advisors getting calls every day from their clients saying, hey, it was climate week this week. What are you doing in my portfolios around that? And advisors are getting caught off guard by this question. They're not prepared for it. So we're trying really hard to educate and then get capital moving in that space. Are you seeing the same thing in the private markets? Definitely, and it really started in the private markets. Endowments, foundations, and family office really have been driving impact. Sometimes I talk to family office and I'll say, are you doing impact investing? And they say no. And then when you really drill down and ask how they're investing, they're investing with their values. And really that's what impact investing is. And values-based investing has been done in family offices for a long time. And now what's happening in a lot of the family offices, and you're seeing this in Nexus and other groups, is that the next generation is going back to mom and dad or grandma and grandpa and saying, you know, we want to have access to that money because we want to drive impact with it. Not, not we want access to it because we want to buy a Lamborghini. We want access to it because we want to see what investments you're making with the dollars that eventually are going to come to us. And also we're seeing the same thing now from parents. They're like, how do we have the conversation with our kids about passing down our investing values to the next generation? So it's becoming very topical. We were hoping to maybe get 100, 150 family offices at the last summit. We got 250. I literally got hate mail from some family offices saying, why wasn't I invited? <laughs> so you know, we'll try to do a bigger, better job next year. But it really is, and Barron's had said this as well, they think it's the fastest growing and largest trend for the next 10 years in the financial industry will be impact and ESG investing. I think it's so interesting because a lot of what we talk about on the show is blockchain and there's so many intersections here in this sector, whether that be tracking or trading, carbon assets, renewable energy, greenhouse gas emissions reduction, all of that. There's so, much, so many ways that blockchain can help here. You're seeing that too? Absolutely. And you really can't track what you need to track. Just as you're saying, I don't want to repeat it, you covered it pretty well, but you can't track what you need to track around impact without blockchain. Um, you know, everything seems to come around, hopefully in enough time and the right time in this case, but you can't do any of the carbon measurement. You can't get the unbanked banked. You can't make the transition in impact that you need to make without blockchain. And it's why you know, I had said this to Vince, it's a really interesting synergy or overlap between how digital assets are being used in the impact space. A lot of the impact investments that we see in the private markets are all around getting communication among the uncommunicated, getting banking into the hands of the bank, getting documentation of workers that are undocumented, and the abuses that can happen when they're undocumented are too huge to mention and horrible. So how are companies addressing these issues in their supply chain? And all of that can work efficiently and better with the blockchain, and I don't see how it can happen without it. Sure. So Jeff, one of our favorite topics that uh, Nisa and I, I speak about all the time, and we talk about blockchain, we talk about the great abilities and the sustainable development goals, or the SDGs, uh, and how they intersect. So, you know, share with us, uh, as you would as part of your education and awareness, what are the SDGs? What do they mean? And, and, and how do we begin to think about moving private sector capital to the benefit and, and to the ultimate goals of 2030 of the SDGs? So in 2015, 193 countries got together and at the UN and agreed on this set of goals. It's 17 overarching goals and 169 subcategories that are most important for us to have a sustainable planet going forward. Climate change, gender diversity, poverty issues, life on water, life on land. So really overarching themes and the fact that the UN got 193 countries to all agree on 169 facts is an overwhelming win in the first place. I also think it's just an incredible 
marketing and branding opportunity. And I don't mean that from a greenwashing standpoint. We want the general population to understand that there are primary needs of this world that we have to rely on, access to clean drinking water, access to temperate climates where we can actually perform our work in. All these things are mandatory for a sustainable planet. And the SDGs, in a great, colorful, impressive way, go out into the marketplace and can translate and get consumers to understand it to start then asking questions of their advisors about the SDGs. Maybe they have a favorite SDG that they want to focus their impact investments on. So it operates as, and the fact that it's a circle, there's no one more important SDG. All of these are important for the sustainability of our planet, but they engage the general population to then engage with their advisor, um, financial advisor, broker, on, you know what, I want to support these. Are there ways that I can support these in my investments? And we're seeing on the top and the asset management firms are starting to look at SDG tracking. Bloomberg has it in their Bloomberg terminal now. So you can track from revenue and other ways. What are these companies doing around the SDGs? Are they supporting them? Are they um, operating against the success of the SDGs? And the targets are for 2030. And look, will we hit those targets? Unfortunately, probably not. But will we be able to use the SDGs to galvanize the general population? to push towards achieving these goals? I think definitely yes. So, so Jeff, clearly you're deeply passionate about this. You've transitioned from traditional financial services to be deeply embedded and engaged around ESG, climate change, the SDGs themselves. Where, where did you get your passion from? Where was this transition? You know, I got very fortunate to help produce a movie called Planetary back in 2014 that came out on Earth Day in 2015. We are facing an ecological crisis that has the capacity to tremendously alter life on Earth. And met a few interesting people, some that you know, Ron Garin, Paul Hawken, Bill McKibben. And Ron and I got to know each other well, and he really gave me a much higher perspective. You know, you want to talk about Ron as an astronaut, for those that don't know, and spend six months on the space station. He has a perspective that most human beings don't have. On that first day, that first day in space, the most spectacular moment was when you look out the window for the first time. When you are able to unstrap out of your seat, your tasks are over, and you get to really take a look at our planet, it's just absolutely breathtaking to see that. And from that perspective, he was able to see the world changing and changing rapidly. And NASA has done a really good job at showing ice melts and all other factors that we need to know about around how the globe is changing. And that passion just overtook me. And I also realized as producer of the film, people are going to start asking me, what was I doing about the problems that we were addressing in the film? And I realized the best way to address it was with capital. Um, there are some studies out that show that capital movement is the most effective way of addressing the SDGs that we possibly have. So I took it upon myself to start looking into that. I moved my clients into that personally and then realized that that wasn't enough. My clients alone weren't going to change the world. So I started addressing the whole advisor and financial community, holding conferences that keep growing um, with coordination with the UN, which has been great. And it's my passion to really get advisors on board because once they get on board, they can unleash all of that capital that their clients control and have towards a better, more sustainable planet. It's so interesting that you chose astronauts versus political figures that were chosen before, right? Yeah, it was really key. We actually did a very informal study, and the least hated group of any profession you could find, even more than firemen, are astronauts. Um, and then we're trying to influence the pale, stale male community. And uh, the pale, stale male community, 60-year-old white men growing up in the United States, they remember being excited and wanting to grow up to be an astronaut. So rather than bring a divisive person out in front of this group that might be partisan one way or the other, so all of a sudden you're not listening to the person because they represent that other group, an astronaut comes out to talk <coughs> about climate change, people listen to him. Great. Well, thank you for all the amazing work. Keep going. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me on the show.